All right, so for the next part, let's talk about uh, continuous integration. This can also be considered an agile method, and it's basically, once again, a collection of best practices, a little like extreme programming. Um, and I'd like to go through these with you now. So the first one, which is really a, a very very basic one, which basically all Agile methods recommend us to, to actually use a code repository. Um, use Git, uh, use GitLab, GitHub, whatever you feel comfortable with, but don't like store your code just on a local network drive. Uh, rec other recommendation regarding code repositories by uh, CI is that you shouldn't use branches too much. So um, especially try to um, to merge back into main uh, or master as soon as possible so that your um, your code doesn't yeah, branch out too much and, and distribute itself across too many disjoint parts. Um, a second very central part of CI is that you should have an automated build. So uh, you should only have to run a single command and everything should, should be yeah, compiled, linked, assembled, tested, and so on. This is also an important aspect uh, that the build should be self-testing. So when you run the build command, then uh, after all uh, everything has su been successfully built, then all the tests should also automatically be uh, be run, and uh, the test results should be uh, should be made visible as as well, good as possible. Um, then the next two good practices are considered to be the, the most central part of continuous integration. First of all, uh, and this is related to using uh, not, uh, not too many branches, is that everybody who's working on the project should merge their code back into mainline at the end of the day at the very least. That means that you don't have as many merge conflicts um, and uh, yeah, your, your code doesn't develop into completely independent uh, branches that then will take a lot of work to, to, uh, to pull or merge together again. And also every time you commit something, um, it should actually be built and uh, consequently also tested. Um, and this, of course, should also be automated. Uh, so this is exactly what we do in the exercises. So we use Travis, which uh, actually has a nice GitHub integration to um, automatically run the Gradle scripts whenever you make a commit. And the Gradle scripts will also run the tests and the final output will tell you uh, quite quickly whether your um, commit succeeded or not. So whether you still have, have uh, test failures or not, for example. Um, of course, uh, if you want to build every commit, that also means that the build should be uh, as fast as possible. So you shouldn't uh, have unnecessary re, uh, recreation, for example, of resource files or something like that in there that will take a lot of time. Um, and what continuous integration also suggests is that you shouldn't have a separate test environment. So, uh, for example, when you're developing an app, that means that you shouldn't actually use the uh, the software simulator uh, to run your tests, but you should have a real phone for that. And of course, that can cause um, additional problems because then you would need to to figure out a way to actually interact with that. Um, real phone in a in a meaningful way and so on but uh, it will help you in the long run because the idea is that if you have a separate test environment that has any uh, significant differences to the production environment then you might either not spot some bugs or your test environment might introduce new bugs that won't actually occur in the production environment so um, it's perhaps a good idea for example if you have a larger uh, number of servers then that one server is a de designated test server that gets new and updated versions of the uh, of the software every time they're built and uh, this is kind of related to a b testing that means if you have a load balancer for example that a small number of users will immediately also test the new build and if you get any problems on that server that means that your latest commit probably uh, introduced some issues. Um, 
CI also suggests that um, for the for the customers or end users, it uh, should be very easy to get the the latest build, the latest uh, release, for example. So they should have a direct download link, uh, for example, where they can always get. Uh, the latest release and maybe even the latest build if they want to test uh, the most recent uh, cutting edge thing. Um, so these are related to the, the uh, deployment aspect. And uh, last but not least, continuous integration also suggests that you should uh, take care that everybody on the team is always aware of how the latest build went. Um, Sometimes companies actually install these physical indicators in their offices where usually they have some kind of traffic light metaphor um, where you can quickly see whether uh, the build failed and whether the most recent co uh, commit obviously introduced some kind of issue. Um, so this is just a, a of course, not a requirement, but a nice thing to have. Often, to to look for details, you also have a dedicated web page that will also always document the current build status and any failures. And so, this just raises kind of awareness in the team regarding how the um, current state of the system is. Um, and last but not least, what uh, CI also suggests is that. Uh, in addition to all the other stuff that uh, is already supposed to be automated, you should also automate the actual deployment. So whenever a build is successful and has passed all the tests, it should immediately be, for example, uh, supplied to the beta testers. This is sometimes then also uh, called continuous deployment, so that uh, basically every new commit will uh, immediately end up in the, the hands of the, the beta testers um, so that you also can immediately get feedback on whether that introduced some kind of new issue. All right, so much of, about continuous integration. Um, there's another slightly more recent term that I'd briefly like to talk about, which is also in, a, in, a, in, a, in the most widest sense, at least an agile method, which is called DevOps. And DevOps is kind of a, uh, a combination of development and operations. Um, and the development side is, uh, if you look at this part, is quite uh, similar to, to Scrum. So you have a, a planning phase, you have a, an actual development phase, you have a, a verification and testing phase, and then a, a deployment phase, basically packaging. And uh, now the operation side then is focusing more on the the maintenance and the uh, yeah the operations of the software so you uh, release it you uh, keep it running you monitor whether it's actually running in the, the right way and that information is then again used to inform the next planning phase um, this also has a strong focus on on automation so that uh, for all the steps you have uh, sort of except for the the planning and and creation maybe you have a script that will uh, will help you perform these these tasks um, there's kind of a controversy around this DevOps concept so uh, some people say that this is of course a, a makes sense to um, integrate the developers and the operations people into one team, maybe into uh, the same person basically, because then they can share expertise from the development and uh, use that during the operations phase. Um, other people have criticized this approach and uh, say that this is just a, 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 a way to reduce uh, reduce employees. So instead of having uh, one development engineer and one operations engineer, you can now uh, just have one DevOps engineer that's ba who's basically doing the work of both. So this isn't without controversy, but the, the fundamental idea behind uh, DevOps is simply that you um, have this again this iterative approach but now instead of just focusing on the development side like uh, for example scrum does um, uh, you also uh, have a similar strong focus on the uh, maintenance and on the operations of the software so that is the whole idea behind um, devops <laughs>
All right, so before we wrap things up, I'd like to give you an, a brief overview of what systems you can actually use to support this uh, these approaches. So we already talked about briefly about uh, Travis and Jenkins, for example, um, who actually are continuous integration tools that uh, provide the link behind uh, between your code repository and the actual build system. Um, now I'd like to give you a brief overview over what build systems are actually available, what we are we using and what are their, are their tasks. So of course the most fundamental task of any build system is to actually perform the compilation and linking by calling onto a compiler, a linker and so on. And this is uh, something we already covered in lecture nine. Um, another important uh, feature that almost all build systems support is so-called dependency resolution. That means uh, if you have internal dependency resolution, that means basically to determine which parts of your code, of your source code, depend on which other parts. And so if you changed one specific file and it has a newer timestamp than some others, which uh, ones do actually need to be recompiled in that case? Um, and on top of that, we sometimes also have build systems which manage external dependencies. That means that they will actually automatically install um, missing libraries, maybe even missing uh, missing tool chains, uh, headers, whatever you name it. So anything that's not directly part of your source code, but which needs to be installed to actually build the source code can sometimes also be handled by the build system itself. Um, then of course we have the aspect of uh, test management. That means that uh, after the build step itself was successful, you would also of course want to run the test suits. This is what just about every agile method, including continuous integration, DevOps and so on suggest. And uh, in most cases, you also would like to see an overview over how many tests succeeded, how many failed, which ones failed with what error. Um, how many percent of the code have actually been covered by the tests. So this is also an important task that your build system should ideally perform for you. Um, and last but not least, you all often also want the system to install the, the actual outcome of the build after the tests have been successful, of course. That means either you just copy them somewhere into your local file system or you uh, build a, some kind of uh, code archive, binary archive, maybe a package that you can install on, uh, on Linux or Mac OS, or maybe you even directly upload the, the product, the compiled uh, new app to the app store so that everybody is immediately able to download it, maybe at least some kind of beta testers. Um, yeah, so these are the tasks that uh, build systems are generally supposed to, to fulfill. And now let's have a look at what we actually have available. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce each one of these in turn. Um, Make is a very ancient build tool. This was originally created in 1976 and it has, it's kind of a scripting language with a rather weird syntax. The, this is generally stored in a file that's simply called make file. Um, and make actually only deals with internal dependencies, so it cannot install any uh, external libraries or something like that. Um, but since it's been around for the, so long and it's j installed just about everywhere, that means also that it's kind of the baseline for build systems and many other build systems actually just build uh, kind of on top of make. So there's lots of external scripts and tools that just extend make so that it gets additional features uh, like resolving ex external dependencies and um, installing things, running tests and so on. Um, one example for, that, for this are the so-called auto tools. Um, they have been quite common in open source projects and uh, especially in those that focus on, on Unix environments like Linux and Mac OS. And the auto tools actually uh, just create a make file in the end that you can then run with regular make to actually build your software. There's a lot of numbers, uh, a large number of tools in 
inside the auto tools, there's for example auto make, there's auto conf, there's configure, and uh, there's actually a dependency chain. So auto conf and auto make together create the configure script, which then in turn actually uh, creates the final make file. So as you can see, this is quite involved. Uh, you can solve a lot of things with auto tools, but they're really, really obtuse. So they are also relying on very old scripting languages like M4, for example. It is, they are capable with, uh, uh, of dealing with external dependencies like libraries and so on, but uh, they also make it very hard to actually write a proper auto tool script. So for that reason, they're kind of being replaced by now in, in most open source project uh, now focus on CMake. Um, in the end, CMake will also just generate a make file that you can then compile with plain make. But uh, CMake is, for example, also capable of outputting a project file for Visual Studio. So you can build the same um, source code and the same with the same build system and can either use uh, Make and GCC or, for example, Visual Studio and the Microsoft compiler. Um, it's available for all platforms and it's basically just a, a scripting language uh, in itself, CMake, which then again uh, uses uh, some other build system like uh, Visual Studio or, or Make uh, as a backend to then perform the actual build. Um, if we look into uh, Java related uh, things, then we often encounter Ant, Maven and Gradle. Uh, each of them is a is a standalone build system that doesn't have any, any other, doesn't need Make or something like that as an additional dependency. As I mentioned, they're mostly focused on Java and they are controlled using either XML files uh, or JSON files. JSON files are for Gradle, XML based ones are for Ant and Maven. And they are also available across all platforms and especially Gradle is often uh, interesting for Android projects. It's kind of the default build system of Android Studio. Um, and what's also important uh, to know is that especially Ant and Maven, and I think yes, also Gradle are capable of actually installing automatically fetching and installing uh, external dependencies. So if your software requires some kind of external library, then you don't even have to think about installing that uh, by yourself. They can actually download and install them uh, completely uh, automatically, which is of course very helpful if you're setting up a new development environment. All right, last but not least, um, there's of course also Eclipse and Xcode and Visual Studio and uh, IntelliJ also. So all of these are IDEs, integrated development environments, and we already talked about them briefly. They are just a large integrated collection of tools like we have the build system, um, the editor, the revision control, front end, and so on and so on. And most of them support quite a number of languages, Java, C++, probably also Python by now. And they have their own integrated build system that's also um, controlled via some kind of build description, for example, in Visual Studio, it's also a, a specific XML file, which can actually be generated by CMake, as we talked about. But um, when you build your entire project inside the IDE, then you will generally also directly use the, um, the internal build system for actually creating the, um, the binaries. Um, yeah, to summarize, uh, here again, it's important to keep in mind that one size doesn't fit all. So there isn't one single build system that you can use for everything. Um, you're generally well off with uh, CMake and Ant, Maven, Gradle uh, for Java projects. Uh, so this is what most open source uh, projects use. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that these build systems can actually 
add a lot of complexity. So uh, for many si really simple personal projects, you don't really need to use uh, a lot of the features. You can just use the default Gradle file, for example, or, may or maybe even as simple as make. So don't try to, to use as many features of the build system as possible, because that might actually just uh, uh, end up uh, being more confusing and more, more difficult to, to configure than if you had just stuck to the basics. So uh, yeah, one size doesn't fit all. I think this is really one very, very important lesson that also applies here. All right, so for the moment, thanks for listening and see you back for the next lecture.